Greetings, everyone. My name is Amanda Flame, and I'm an assistant professor at James Madison College of Public Affairs and the Department of Sociology at Michigan State University. While I welcome you to the panel, I will be accompanied by slideshow of a photo documentary project by one of our panelists, Ori Huying. So I invite you to meditate on these very moving images while I um, welcome everybody to the panel. On behalf of my co-organizers at University of Hawaii, the East West Center and Chiang Mai University's Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainability, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome everyone to this webinar on migration, mobility, and the Mekong. We want to send a special thanks of gratitude to the Luce Foundation for its support of our collaborations. And we invite anyone in the audience who would like to know more about our work or the webinar series to reach out to us. Very quickly, I have a brief announcement. The Center for Chinese Studies and the Center for Southeast Asia Studies at University of Hawaii a joint webinar will be held Wednesday, March 3rd from noon to 1.20 p.m. And in this webinar, Dr. Erica Brinley and Dr. Wingsheng Wang will discuss civilizing the South, colonialism and cultural change in ancient East Southeast Asia. So University of Hawaii and the East West Center have been organizing webinars for a while. And my colleagues at MSU and I are grateful to be invited to co-convene this four part series on the future of the Mekong River. Our webinar on migration tonight follows the first, the first one on Mekong commodities, which was held last month. And we will, publish, uh, we will publicize and post this shortly for people who were unable to attend. You can, you can, you'll be able to view this soon. In the first webinar, panelists raised a lot of questions about the interconnection between commodity chains and household livelihoods, which also brought up the question of migration and mobility and livelihood strategies. To this end, our panel tonight will extend many of those fruitful discussions. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to introduce you to this panel of exceptional people. Panwen Yoking is a fellow at the East West Center in Hawaii. She was trained as an applied development economist and gender specialist. She has worked as a consultant for IFPRI on a women's empowerment and agriculture and for UNSCAP, leading a team of statisticians and analyzing labor force and time use surveys. Her work, in direct, her work directly engages policy relevant concerns of gendered inequalities in the division of labor among households. Nadao is assistant professor in the Department of Social Science at York University. She has 25 plus years of research experience in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, working on topics of dam and development induced displacement and environmental justice with a focus on upland ethnic minority peoples. She is also the founder of the Vietnam River Network, Vietnam Rivers Network, which works on river protection in Vietnam and in the region more broadly. Ori Huying is an independent documentary photographer from Singapore. In her practice, which revolves around storytelling in Southeast Asia, she is drawn to narratives of people and places affected by development. For the past 10 years, she has been documenting the, Chi the China Lao High Speed Railway Project and dam construction on the Mekong River. Most recently, she received the National Geographic Explorer Grant to continue her work on the Mekong River and dams. Finally, Heather Peters is a research and applied anthropologist specializing in China with a focus on safeguarding the cultures and rights of ethnic minorities of China's southwestern provinces. She worked as a senior consultant for the, for the culture unit in the UNESCO Bangkok office for over 15 years, developing and implementing projects in China, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Myanmar. She is currently research coordinator at the Ophidian Research Institute based in Philadelphia, where she continues to conduct research on and accept consult consultancies for projects in Southwest China and the Mekong countries. So as a way to begin, I'll invite the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and talk about how their work and interests intersect with concerns of migration, mobility, and the Mekong. Panwin, if you would please go ahead and start for us. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. I am Panwin, originally from Bangkok, Thailand. My main field of specialization is development economics. My research focuses on a wide range of development and gender issues in developing countries, including child labor in Thailand, as well as land ownership and women's empowerment in Northern Ghana. And through the RICE project that focuses on Southeast Asia and land use project in Nepal, 
both of the project are led by uh, Dr. Jefferson Fox. I recently became interested and in conducted work focusing on migration related research topics. For example, I wrote uh, a paper focusing on the impact of migration on labor force participation of elderly children and working age population uh, living in migrant sending households in rural Nepal. And I am currently working on a paper focusing on the impact of migration and remittances on rice production and income in Cambodia. And uh, through the rice project, I had an opportunity to participate in field work back in 2000, summer 2019 in central Thailand. And we collaborated with Konkan University in Thailand to collect data from over 270 farmers in six provinces of central Thailand. And the pictures that you see here on your screen are the subset of few work pictures that I have. And uh, on your left here is a picture of Ubon Rashatani students, PhD and undergraduate students and myself uh, interviewing an elderly male farmer we were conducting pilot and cognitive testing of our survey questionnaire. And on the right hand side here is a picture of me interviewing a female farmer on her field. And the reason why I chose those two pictures are not only because those are awesome pictures or, or because they are one of my favorite interviewees, but one of the main characteristics that those two households have in common is that they're they are both migrant sending households. And so I am very much looking forward to sharing my perspective and my work experience on migration in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Panmin. Um, please go ahead, Nga. Um, Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Amanda, for very nice introductions. Um, uh, as you know, I'm originally from Vietnam, and now I work um, at York University in Toronto. Um, my work focuses mostly, like Amanda say, on um, development-induced displacement, uh, and I uh, work with people who were displaced by, by dam and other development projects. And mostly I focus on how you know, people livelihood change, uh, not just their life, but also change in terms of like gender role responsibilities. I wrote for, um, you know, article on, on how land grabs, like land grab caused by, by the dam and by other development projects, uh, you know, bring change in people's families' um, uh, life, right? They, they, gender role and responsibilities and how they uh, have to um, learn all the new things, right? To, to adapt to change that brought to them by development projects. Uh, here you see that two uh, photos that I took from my film work. One is the, um, on the right side, the construction of the Sola uh, Dam, um, that's the biggest dam in Vietnam with a design capacity of 2,400 megawatt. Uh, the construction started in 2005 and the pictures that I took that uh, in 2009. And on the left hand side is the um, um, photo of a resettled families uh, who's eth um, black Thai ethnic. And the reason that I chose this photo because this massive hydropower plant, um, you know, the dam, um, which is uh, 215 meters tall that caused displacement of about 100,000 people across three different provinces in the northwest uh, of Vietnam. And more than 80% of those um, displaced people belong to Thai ethnic group, both um, we call Thai Chang and Thai Dan, the black uh, Thai and white Thai, um, and other uh, also ethnic minorities in, in the regions. Uh, the, the projects flooded um, more than 20,000 hectares, right? And, and, and about 10,000 of that was agricultural land, including like rice paddies and garden fish pond. And uh, so in many um, of the people, probably more than 80% again, right? Um, they, they was depending entirely on, on farming. So that's um, when they moved, it, it's very difficult for them. And the house here that the, the family here that I, um, we visit in one 
evening 2005. When we came there, it was very dark. We couldn't see anything. But the next morning, we saw like everything, right? The houses were just mine and, and those um, houses were standing uh, in that room village. And somebody, uh, you know, the headman explained that those houses belonged to a few families who, who refused to, to move. They wanted to stay no matter what happened. And so, you know, that's probably the, the only way, uh, maybe one of the very few ways that they could do to show their resistance. And uh, the remaining of the, the village, just, you know, just like this family, they had to move. Uh, so, you know, obviously when, when development project like them cause um, a lot of disruptions for people's lives. It's uh, especially for people who um, in the mountain or remote area, it's very, very difficult for them. Um, so that's that's why I think that is very, very powerful photos that I would like to share with you guys. And I'm looking forward to share more um, later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nga. Next, we have Heather. Um, hello, everyone. And again, thank you, Amanda, for your introduction. And it's wonderful to see the other members of the panel again, uh, after getting to know you for the past few weeks. Um, uh, I'm an, as Amanda has noted, I'm an anthropologist specializing in China and Southeast Asia, and have taught at the University of Pennsylvania. However, for most of my life, I've been working uh, with you that uh, live not only along the river, but also in the greater Mekong region. Uh, throughout my years of experience doing this development work, um, I've observed that many development projects fail, and when they do so, the reason is usually because of culture. Frequently, uh, the people who develop the projects do not fully understand the cultures of the people with whom they're working, and or they do not include the people for whom the projects are intended, and by doing so, they fail to grasp the importance of culture in the lives of the people in the project area. Uh, so uh, for my introduction I'm, and for my slides here, I'm going to point out two pictures that are connected with dams. Um, and the one on the left uh, is in Atapu. And uh, one of my concerns regarding dams is not just the impact they have on people's culture with regard to displacement and relocation, but what happens to people and culture when the dams fail? And this is something that I have been involved in. On July 23rd, 2018, following heavier than usual rains, the saddle dam in Sanamsai district, Atapu province in Southern Laos breached. The resultant floodwaters inundated 12 villages, killing at least 40 persons and displacing more than 6,000. The Lao government welcomed assistance immediately from the international community. And by mid-August, early September, the government facilitated um, by a joint UN development group, the World Bank and the EU had put together a team of experts to conduct a post-disaster needs assessment. Interestingly though, when the team was first compiled, cultural experts were not included. Um, the UNESCO office was finally contacted and asked to contribute a small team, but only after the post-disaster team had begun their work. I was asked to be part of this team. And I sort of wanted to say that UNESCO has developed a specific strategy to assess post-disaster cultural needs, which underscore the importance of culture as a means of healing and a way to build resilience. And one of the things that we learned during our field work for this assessment um, was that um, was the importance of not just the loss of livelihoods for the communities, but the loss of their temples, which were not which which they see not just as part of their lives, but they're they're the um, they're the heart and the soul of their communities. Uh, so rebuilding temples and reviving annual rituals and festivals. Festivals may not be the first priority when officials are faced with urgent basic needs of providing food and water and housing and medical care. However, the repair must follow quickly thereafter because they often provide, uh, they often prove vital for the community members to recover their lives. So that's the picture on the right. And you can see um, that the floods were so bad that people were standing on the roofs of their homes and also on the roof of the temples. Um, 
continuing with the theme of the dams, on the left, I have a, an aerial view of Long Prabang. And I've spent many years working with communities living in and around Long Prabang, which was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1995. As part of the Lao government's strategy to turn Laos into the Battery of Asia, a new dam is currently being built 25 kilometers upstream from Long Prabang. The usual host of issues are being debated, namely the relocation of the villagers from their homes, the agricultural fields, and the increased disruption of the natural ecology of the river. However, the fact that Long Prabang is a UNESCO World Heritage Site poses additional complications. As a World Heritage Site, the Lao government has agreed to UNESCO requirements for management and safeguarding, um, and safeguarding. What impact will the dams have on both the buffer and core zones of Long Prabang? And what is the risk of a dam breach? These are issues um, that are foremost in the minds of many members of the Long Prabang community, as well as the officials at UNESCO. If the dam impacts the heritage values of Long Prabang, this would alter the very criteria upon which the site was nominated, thereby creating potential violations of UNESCO World Heritage Standards. This in turn could lead to a designation of World Heritage in danger. The culture of Long Prabang is also deeply entwined with its river environment, an element which is part of the World Heritage designation and its authenticity. It is projected that the dam project would eliminate the free flow of the two rivers which flank the historic peninsula, turning the World Heritage Site into a lake or a reservoir. Not only would this be devastating for its World Heritage status, but would dramatically change the cultural traditions of the communities. Finally, the damage, a dam breach similar to what happened in Atapu could have on the heritage town itself is beyond imagination. So these two pictures are here just to illustrate. Um, we usually talk about the impacts of dams with regard to the immediate communities. Um, but in this instance, I wanted to focus on the impacts of what the dam could do if it breached and the, these very serious dangerous risks it could cause for the two, it could cause for the two communities. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, okay, so last we'll welcome Ori to introduce herself and some of her work. And I want to just briefly draw the attendees attention to the chat. Um, uh, Carlin has noted that when Ori shows her video, you can manually turn off live transcription if it helps you read her um, subtitles. And then I also, um, yeah, want to just make sure everybody understands you're welcome and encouraged to enter your questions into the Q&A. Please go ahead, Ori. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us here and thanks Amanda for the introduction. Um, so I'm a photographer based in Singapore, but I've worked extensively in Southeast Asia. My interest in Laos uh, started around 2010 when I learned about the China Laos High Speed Railway Project. I wanted to understand what was happening, um, what's the motivations and what kind of impact would it have on the people and environment in Laos. So um, I interviewed different experts on the topic and I also photographed um, along the proposed railway route in Laos. So as you can imagine, I actually walked away with more questions. So um, right now I want to show you a short multimedia video which I put together at a time in my attempt to make sense of the issue. The information and aesthetics might be out of date, but I think the questions raised in this video are still relevant and even applicable to other development projects in Laos. Can we have the video please? Thanks. We also follow the Chinese proverb. If you want to be rich, be a road. If you want to be rich faster, you build a big road. If you want to be very wealthy, build a railroad. So now we have only 3.5 kilometers. My minister always said that this 3.5 kilometers is like the American footstep on the moon, the first step, but it is a big step for mankind. The mantra that exists in Laos is to convert Laos from a landlocked country to a land-linked country. 
the hilly terrain makes it very difficult from an engineering perspective and it's going to be very expensive too. This country is now being catapulted into a market economy. But Laos doesn't have the resources. The entire society was never structured that way. Where you have transport, you have a greater level of human activity and interaction. Trafficking, an impact on the environment, may have to displace some communities. <laughs> China has been very active in proposing a number of real projects to Laos. Even though the Chinese are willing to fund for everything, nothing is so free in this world. There's probably some type of agreement, probably access to natural resources. If economic is in buying and selling, that is be good. It's a shift of resource to be a surplus in one area and a deficit in another area. But is that only one? Okay, you need economic growth. But who is benefiting from that growth? Are the people who are producing, whose lands have gone for mining, have their incomes risen? Are their children going to school? Has that money actually been channeled back into society? The trickle-down principle has been around for so long. There's certainly a fault expectation from it. Trickle-down may 10, 20 percent, but what's not trickle-down will be accumulated somewhere as where the shift continues. Laos, when negotiating with China, doesn't have any bargaining power. It's really what China wants. So it's not a purely transport or engineering or even a logistical perspective that is sufficient to explain what is going to happen or why is it so slow. There are many levels and probably the first level is money. The question is whether the foreign investment also brings some benefit to the country. If a country's development is just based on exploitive industry, it won't last long. In economics, we call it the curse of the resource-rich countries. We're going to see much more migration. Demographics will change. People are going to be hungrier. Trafficking of especially women and children is likely to increase. The problem is Laos is the last corner. All its neighbors are starving for natural resources. Development comes only if you continue to have some resources. But Laos will not be able to tap on its neighbors. We're playing a game that we know for sure we lose, but we don't know what other game to play. It's a big task, but there's no choice. This is the way we have to go to. Thank you, Ori, for sharing this film. And I think these introductions with the images and the film um, give us, uh, provide an incredible platform for us to think through some of these um, accelerating inequities between those who can move quickly, those who are moving um, by choice with agency, questions of those you know who are being displaced, et cetera. So um, it's a great space actually to switch gears following the leadership of our first brave panelists in webinar one, um, it worked very well to host a conversation where each person was given a question that they could, you know, really show the excellence of their work and highlight the concerns that they introduced in their introductions. So what will happen now is that I will pose a question to each panelist. They'll have five minutes to um, respond. And then we'll open for the panel, for the rest of the panelists, to respond, ask questions, and perhaps provide additional insights from their own work. And we'll do this for the next 35, 40 minutes. And then we'll open it for audience questions. So again, please go ahead and enter your questions as they come up to you. And then Dr. Courtney Work, who is generously behind the scenes fielding your questions and is hosting the next panel um, is going to provide them to me so that I'm sure I can give everybody a chance to be heard, even though we can't see you. So the first question will be taken up by Panwin. Um, so after Panwin gives us some initial thoughts on the matter, um, right, everyone will have a chance to respond to find where I am on the sheet. Okay, so our first question for Panwin is, 
What is the scale of mobility across and along the Mekong? Why are people moving and what are the impacts of this mobility for local and rural livelihoods and of household and family life? Thank you for the questions, Amanda. Um, so in terms of the response to the first question, the scale of labor migration across the Mekong, um, labor migration in the greater Mekong sub-region is about at least three to five million workers. However, a precise estimate is difficult because very little data are available pertaining to this topic. But uh, to provide greater contextual background, Thailand is essentially the sub-regional hub for labor migration because it holds approximately 70, uh, 60% of the total migrants and 80% of which are essentially from Myanmar. And a large proportion of labor migrants work in low skilled jobs and are irregular workers. And in terms of the driver of uh, migration, migration in this, in this region is driven predominantly by economic disparity. So essentially wage differentials, it dictates the direction as well as the volume of labor mobility. For example, the average month, monthly wage in Thailand is three times above uh, those of Cambodia and Laos. And another factor that has a, a facilitated migration in this sub-region is demographic inequalities. So Thailand and Vietnam, for example, are two countries in the region with aging population and labor shortage, while uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, um, they have labor surplus. So they're still benefiting from the demographic dividend. So that's why there's an inflow of migrants from uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, and Myanmar to Thailand. Other factors that facilitate labor migrants, it uh, includes improved connectivity, such as the Thai-Lao friendship breach, and also easing of visa requirement among the ASEAN nations. And also weak governance, uh, it also contributes to irregular migration, which often can lead to smuggling activities, uh, overstaying, changing employers, for example, and also sudden shocks such as natural disaster, uh, particularly drought and sudden floods can also uh, drive migration within the Mekong sub-region. And lastly, political events such as what has been happening in Myanmar can definitely increase labor migration. And in terms of the impact on of migration, of labor migration, I will focus on agriculture since the economy of the Mekong is predominantly agricultural. So contextually, uh, labor migration out of agriculture from an economic perspective, uh, it is an important household strategy because it reduces income risk as well as volatility through the diversification of uh, uh, household sources of income but it also contributes to depopulation in rural areas. And the majority of the studies, including uh, my study on Cambodia, it suggests that migration has a negative impact on farm output. So in, in our case, uh, migration has a negative impact on rice production as well as rice income, especially among those households with uh, facing credit constraint. And this is because less labor is available for a household agricultural production. But migration is a source of investment and innovation for, for the agricultural sector through remittances. So remittances can be invested in productive assets in agriculture, such as irrigation system, uh, tractor, fertilizer, so on and so forth. And Remittances can essentially help farm households to move from labor intensive activities in agriculture to capital intensive activities. And several studies, including uh, this paper, including our paper on um, Cambodia, show that remittances do have a positive impact, but in our case, it's a small positive effect on rice production and rice income. So, this essentially shows that remittances can compensate for the loss of farm labor due to the withdrawal of uh, household family members because of migration. 
But uh, there are other studies that show that remittances do not have any impact on agriculture at all. And this is predominantly because remittances can be used in non-productive assets or can encourage conspicuous consumption. And they're not uh, necessarily spent on labor or non-labor inputs in agriculture. But overall, the effect of migration on labor and agricultural production or the well-being of households uh, in migrant sending countries is less well understood, especially from quantitative point of view. So this calls for a more data collection effort focusing on migration in the greater Mekong sub region to facilitate evidence-based and policy recommendation to stimulate, uh, to further stimulate agricultural development in this sub region. Thank you, this is all for me. Thank you, Panmin. So, um, Carolyn, if we could switch to panel view, um, gallery view, then we'll invite the panelists um, to respond. Audience members, on, on our end, sometimes it's a little hard to um, see each other. Ah, now we feel like we're together when we can, when we can see each other. So, um, this is a few minutes to offer questions and insights um, and just draw on on Panwin's insights. Thank you so much for that overview, Panwin. Everyone is so polite. We don't want to take up space. Um, Nga, do you have anything you wanted to add or Ore or Heather? Uh, okay, I, th I think that the I just want to raise this here because it's uh, the labor mobilities in, in Vietnam is, uh, you know, especially the, for the two large uh, river basin, like the Red River Basin and the Mekong River Basins, also a big uh, issue recently. And, and I think that's for, for the Mekong, the recent report, it's also like point out that, uh, you know, the huge number like millions of people actually migrate. So. I mean, it's um, it's all, all because um, I guess I, to to what uh, um, Fanny said, right? It's an economic reason. People move all over the place, you know, to find uh, job employment to to earn more income to support their family back home. So I, I think that's a big issue in Vietnam as well. Mm. Um, I think Heather, did you want to add something? You're just muted. Can you unmute yourself? And <laughs> you keeps changing. Um, I think I'm muted. I'm unmuted now, right? Um, Panvin, I just wanted to ask you in your uh, studies, I know from having been in Thailand that there's a lot of tension between the um, the amount of migration that comes in from Myanmar and also from Laos with the Thai government. Does your research uh, look at any of those questions? I mean, they. we know that Thailand needs a lot of the labor that is coming in. And there's been some work, I think, by the government to try to, 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 try to develop legal channels, but a lot of people still just flow, I think, back and forth across the border um, without going through legal channels. Is that part of your research or not right now? And what do you think about that? <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Unfortunately, it, it was not part of the research question that we looked at for uh, for Cambodia or my past research on that, but I can address that question. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there, there are a huge amount of uh, illegal uh, migrant workers coming from Myanmar, and it's particularly a problem during the pandemic because they have very limited access to health care, especially, you know, because now we have a recent uh, local uh, community spread of, of COVID. And a lot of Burmese migrants, especially those who are undocumented, they are afraid to get COVID tests because, because they are undocumented. Mm -hmm. So it's a major problem, but the Thai government, because of the COVID, they have actually eased the visa restriction. So any undocumented immigrants from Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar who are living in Thailand illegally right now, they can actually obtain a work permit to stay in the country for two years in order to curb the effects of, 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 of the COVID-19. So now they can have access to, once, once their paperwork is done, they, have, they can have access to the government hospital and get 
uh, tested, but but it's it's definitely an an important issue, and I think the government is attempting to address this. That's very good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, it's it has been a problem. I think medical treatment for the migrants, the illegal migrants, and this is very good to hear that the government is thinking more of the general health of the sort of public health questions rather than just focusing on the issues of illegality or um, legal migrants, but saying health crisis comes first. So that, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, I wanna give anyone else on the panel a chance if there was another thought on the matter before we switch. I, um, in terms of thinking about, you know, the way, well, I would like, I would like the audience certainly concerns about xenophobia and surveillance of migrants and the connection between surveillance of people who are undocumented um, and the stigma of documentation that's growing in the region um, raises huge concerns about this tension between public health imperatives and the ways that migrants also get scapegoated for being super spreaders, et cetera. And so the question, I think we could spend the whole panel talking about this particular set of tensions and hopefully we'll have some time um, towards the end of the discussion if audience and members are interested to talk more about it because obviously it's an extremely pressing issue and concerning um, access could be could be formalized and yet people might experience hospitals as um, deeply unsafe or, or suspect or unsafe for various reasons. And, and Heather, your your comments on culture will, will obviously add to that. So that's great. Panman, thank you so much for getting us started with such a, a, a kind of 30,000 foot view of, of movement in the region. And, and it um, is laying some excellent groundwork that I think Nas questions will build off really beautifully. So, Nas going to take the second question. Um, what is the scale of dam-induced displacement along the Mekong and how does displacement affect people's lives and livelihoods? Um, well, thanks for the question, Amanda. Um, wow, I guess many of us probably know 200 uh, dams larger than uh, 50 megawatt, right? Plan or, or under construction or completed under you know, in, in the, the Mekong um, Basin portion, the Thailand, Vietnam, or Cambodia, and Laos. Um, and so many of them are complete in the Mekong uh, tributaries. For example, uh, we have in Vietnam, um, dozens of large dam uh, was built on territory um, of, the, um, uh, of, the, of Vietnam, right? On the sea sand and strip of rivers. Um, and it's, uh, you know, in Laos, uh, on so we know the bills on the mainstream, right? The Zabori Dam, Dong Sa Hong, Pak Bang, or Sanakam Dams. Most of these dams involve large scale population displacement, right? So I would say like hundreds of thousands of people. And I'm sure that the formal number is always lower, um, you know, that's uh, higher than, um, you know, the, the formal number, I mean, like the on papers often lower than the actual number. That's from my, my experience. Um, and, and that was also not included, uh, dam built in other part of the, you know, the each countries uh, in the regions. And so also not included the number of people who were displaced uh, to make way for the 11 massive dam upstream um, of the Mekong in China, right? And, and maybe it's, Worth to note that uh, China's role in dam building trend is is you know stalling, right? It's um it's uh, probably home for about like half of the world large dam, right? And and um, I remember, if not mistaken, uh, some years ago, report um from the Ministry of um, Water Resources in in China uh, acknowledged that at least a. Uh, 15 million people have been involuntarily resettled in the country over the last few decades. Um, so also I think it's worth to note that like when we talk about dam induced displacement, it's not just about, um, you know, uh, making way for, for dam constructions, dam collapse in other costs that we um, we know, right? Just like Heather was mentioned in, in the introduction, right? The, the uh, sudden dam is collapse that caused displacement of about almost like 7,000 villagers. And in general for, for people when they had to move, like they, they you know, forced to displace that 
for them, they had very, very hard time to recover their livelihood after the resettlement. Um, in my interviews back in 2019 with resettlement from uh, people from Sơn La Dam and even from uh, Black Bong Dam in the Central Highlands on, on the Sesan um, River, um, that people after 10 years, 15 years, a number of them still don't feel, um, you know, they didn't feel home in the new place. So it's very, very difficult, right? And and in terms of people's lives, we know that dams are often built in, in upland regions, right? Where, where most of the, you know, population are ethnic minorities. So naturally, um, for, for the dam, whenever the dam floods those villages, right? It floods also the rice land, the riverbank garden, um, and people often had to move to a place um, where there are not much land for farming or to area where, you know, um, they have to share with uh, peop other people who have been settled there for a long time. So it, it's, you know, I think that land shortage is the most common issue in most resettlement sites in Vietnam and, and other places in the Mekong regions. Um, and and um, the livelihood recovery in the new place have been one of the most um, you know, critical challenges that resettler encounter. Um, so, and often, I think that one of the issues that, uh, you know, when you just move, people never think about or they thought about that. And when they were asked to move, they never thought of it, that when that people often have to move from a life without much demand for having cash to a life when they need cash for almost everything, right? In the old village, for example, you know, they fish, they cultivate their rice, uh, you know, upland crops, uh, they have their cattle or fish pond, they have access to the forest for their fuel, um, the wild vegetable or medical earth. So they almost never had to spend money for food. So that's that the, the thing, right? Um, and uh, in the photo here that I show, um, you know, the, the boat, that um, the boat was left abandoned because people could no longer use uh, it for fishing because they had to move far from the river. So um, the boat went abandoned, people had to learn the new way of doing like um, for, for their livelihood. Um, the, uh, these uh, photos of people was displaced from the playground dam um, on the sea sands, um, a tributary of the Mekong. Um, and um, on here on the left side, you see that the uh, rooftop, it's very typical, right? And that's for resettlement side in, in the Northwest where people are displaced from Sunla or, or Lai Chou's projects that are uh, similar. You, you can recognize it just anywhere you go because it's the same type of rooftop that make very big noise every time it's rain. Um, so and in general, like it's, you see that with the new village, it's far from the rivers and people cannot fish in the river. So whenever, you know, in the new place, if they want to eat fish, they need to buy it. The same for rice and other food stuff. Uh, and, and some community even face water problem. Um, you know, we have no access to, to certain area like clean water or water for, for farming. Um, and, in many places, people had to learn a new way of farming. Like, you know, you um, move from the area when you just grow rice or just, uh, you know, upland crop like corns or cassava, they have to move a place that where they have to learn how to grow teas or other fruit tree like plums or peaches. And I mean, the new crop that they never did before. So, you know, they had to learn how to graze different type of pigs that you know that need to be confined in a barn right before they just let the pig run freely um, in the village right and and some in the northwest of vietnam for example resettlement uh, resettler became workers in rubber plantations and land shortage also like uh, and the the demand for cash have led to quite a sharp rise in our migration among young people. Some villages that I, uh, you know, um, recently visited, um, not recently, it's back to, to 2019 again, because uh, um, um, because of pandemic, right? It's, uh, I was unable to visit them more, more recent, but back from 2019, it's, it's some villages, like 100% young people was gone somewhere. Uh, you could only find middle age or old people with children at home. 
um, like, so it's really fit to what uh, Pang Yun talk about how people migrate everywhere. I mean, one village that I remember, they said every single boys when they turn 14, they would leave the home to find some employment, like, you know, job somewhere to, to work. They could go do whatever they could find could fight to get some cash to send back to, to support their parents because they, had, they didn't have enough land to grow their crop, right? Um, then as a result, it has led to a lot of change, right? I said like the family um, connections and role, um, man, wife and husband, right? That their role within the house. Uh, and it's, you know, the control chains. I know Heather would talk more about that, but from I, what I see is from farming practice to, you know, to keep like traditional dance or song or festival. Uh, also the sentiment, um, sentiment and connection with the old place. Like I say, some people even after 15 years, 17 years, they, feel, they still feel like they miss their homeland so much. They miss the river, they miss the land, they miss the forest, right? Um, so, um, so like I say, uh, and also another problem get affect people's life and livelihood is that the relationship between the resettle communities and the host community, the community who, who's receive people, you know, share land with the people. Oh, you know, uh, the host community, many cases they consider, oh, the resettle came uh, to, to take away their land and other resources, make resources more scarce. And then, you know, we see the fighting. So, yeah, you know, you it's not easy for people in the, yeah, yeah. This is excellent. It raises a whole range of questions, actually, that um, that we, I think, both Ori and Heather are going to get at. So thank you so much for covering so much ground on that. Um, in order to keep moving and make sure we have time for audience questions, I'm just going to go ahead and direct the third question to Ori. But I know people are asking questions directly about issues of dam-induced displacement from the audience. So we'll have time to come back in um, in the final section with audience questions. So thank you so much, Nga. The third question is directed to Ore. How are communities in Southeast Asia experiencing the growing roles of Chinese migration and development in the region? How are Chinese migrants and developers experiencing and interpreting these phenomena as well? And a really, I think, important question to ask when so much I recognize my face in this audience. I'm an, I'm an American national. There's a lot of kind of big politics about China and the US, et cetera. And, and this panel and this series is really trying to, to under, to subvert that narrative and begin from people's experiences. And so I also wanna ask um, whose stories and voices are, are missing or overlooked in these discussions? Go ahead, Ori. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the question, Samanda. Um, I can only speak based on my experience in Boten. It's a border town uh, north of Laos. It's next to China. And the photos that you see on screen right now, um, it's it's from there. So you can see it's really, a, it's the, the the buildings, you know, it's really quite tall and something that you, you don't really see in, in, uh, in Laos. And it's like, a, you know, a town that's developing out of nowhere. Um, yeah, so the, the, the town, the, the land has been leased to a Chinese company. It's designated as a special economic zone and it lies along the high-speed rail route. So it's going, to, it's going to be the first station as the high-speed train, as the proposed high-speed train arrives from, uh, from, from China. Yeah. So previously it was developed as a casino town, but that's no longer the case. And currently it's, it's being redeveloped as a tourist destination and I don't know, a, a, a trading center. So I first visited Botan in 2008. And since then I've been back a, a few more times. Most recently in 2019, I went back with a TV crew and we filmed a story about the town. It's a part of a documentary series called Borderlands. The series is commissioned by Channel News Asia. It's possible to catch the, the, the full series online if you guys are interested. Um, so now I'm just going to show you a short preview of the Botan episode so that you can get a sense of the place. Uh, can we play the video now, please? Thanks.
It's a place where two different countries and two different cultures meet. It's in some borders, it's like a wild west. My photo is basically about the life and death and then a rebirth of this border town. Thanks for sharing the video. Um, so while I was there, I spoke to people, different groups of people, um, local villagers who were displaced, uh, the locals who migrated to Boten for work, and also uh, Chinese businessmen who started restaurants and guest house there. And interestingly, we also met a group of transgender performers from Thailand. They moved to Boten to work in a cabaret there. Um, and generally, I find that with the locals, there are two types of experiences with regards to Chinese migrants and developers. The villagers who have been displaced, they told us that uh, they were promised land and work opportunities after relocation. And then, you know, with Boten being developed and more companies coming in, you know, there will be more money uh, and, you know, they would benefit from that. But of course, that didn't happen. So before relocation, uh, you know, they were self-reliant as all of them owned land they could farm. And as what Na shared with us earlier, so after relocation, you know, the villagers lost their money and uh, they have to buy basic necessities like food and, uh, and water, which they never had to do so before. Um, and they do see more money coming to the area, but the money was traded and uh, moved around and it just bypasses them completely. Um, the, the younger generation who are more resourceful, they're able to find work in Chinese construction and railway companies. But for the elderly who are not so adaptable, they are, they are they're left behind. Um, and then the other group of locals, the ones who moved to Boten in search of work, um, they're really excited about the new development and they're very happy to work for the Chinese companies because they're being paid more and then uh, they find the work more systematic as well. Uh, but yet, in spite of that, they, they, they too express concern that, you know, as more Chinese arrives to, to Boten, there's less land available for the locals. So um, now to answer the next question about how the Chinese migrants and developers are experiencing uh, this phenomenon. Um, one Chinese restaurant owner in Boten that I spoke to, he used this Chinese proverb to explain why he ended up there. Uh, it's loosely translated to, um, in the poorest places, uh, there lies the most business opportunities. I think that kind of sums up the motivation of a lot of them. Uh, you know, they, they moved from China to Laos in search of uh, better work opportunities, better business opportunities, and generally just a better life for themselves. Um, this, this also kind of reflects a deep cultural difference between the Laotians and the Chinese. Of course, you know, there's communication barriers and other cultural clashes between the Laos and the Chinese there. But uh, from what we see, you know, both of both groups try to make it work. Um, There's uh, another interesting observation that I made when I was there. Um, some of the Chinese, they don't consider Boten to be part of Laos. They see it as a middle ground where Laos and China interconnects and then that Laos starts beyond, uh, beyond Boten. Yeah. So uh, now we come to the last question, whose stories or voices are often missing and overlooked in this discussion? Um, as a storyteller, I'm interested in why people do the things they do and how they react in diff uh, difficult circumstances. I feel that this is the way we can relate to each other and have empathy for someone else. Right? So I feel that in the discussions surrounding development issues, the stories of the displaced locals don't get heard enough. Like for example, uh, when I was in Boten, I met a young man. Uh, it's, it was actually his first day at work for the railway company. 
So he told us that he and his family, they have been displaced three times already due to firstly the development of the special economic zone and then subsequently because of the railway uh, building. And he said that everything happened so quickly and uh, it was hard for him to explain what he feels in words. I mean, when I heard that, my heart just goes out to him because he probably hasn't had, uh, hasn't processed what happened and he feels very helpless because he has no control over the situation. Um, I feel that stories like his need to be told so that we can better understand the human cost of such displacements. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Ori. Um, and again, I think because I perhaps have failed the panelists already by, by not managing my own time, we'll go ahead and take Heather's question. And then um, I know that the, the Q&A is lighting up. And for those of you who are, are writing questions, um, just so you know, Courtney is going to be, um, or Dr work is going to be working through them and then sending them to me so that I can summarize them. So we won't probably have time to do individual questions, but hopefully we'll be able to kind of uh, cluster them and make sure we address them in broad themes. Um, so Heather has the last question. How should culture be considered with regard to issues of migration, resettlement, displacement, and mobility? And why is this important? Thank you, Amanda. Um, I think I that think my... Oh. Has, there I am. Good. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I also wanted to add to the issues of development, migration, resettlement, and displacement. And in fact, I'm going to focus more on development um, and resettlement and displacement as part of my question. Um, because I'm the person who's thinking most about culture, um, I first want to, uh, I first would like to actually define what I mean by culture. And um, I'm, I'm not simply talking about architecture, art, and literature. Um, I think for the anthropologist, um, although these are certainly aspects of culture, instead what I'm talking about is the anthropological sense of culture. Uh, in that regard, it is a socially constructed grammar of behavior. It defines how a cultural community um, behaves and functions and distinguishes itself from other cultural communities. Um, culture is passed between generations through social learning, and during the intergenerational transmission, culture, in fact, can acquire new behaviors, it can confirm or modify previous ones, and people can consciously decide to change their cultural practices. Um, UNESCO uh, is the only international agency that is uh, uh, that is recognized to address culture, defines it as a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of a society or a social group, um, and that it encompasses, in addition to art and literature, lifestyles, ways of living together, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. So this is just to give you a sense of when I talk about culture, I'm not just talking about the temples or the songs and dances. It's the rituals behind the, te the temples. It's the worldview that the people have. It's their agricultural systems. It's how they think about life. Um, and this is what's really important, I think, when you're working on development projects. Um, I have found that uh, the vast majority of articles, if you read them, uh, that, that discuss the impacts of hydropower dams uh, in the Mekong, focus on the impacts uh, that these projects have on ecosystems, community livelihoods, and agricultural land. Uh, this focus applies as well to discussions of the impacts caused by the displacement, resettlement, and migration resulting from these projects. Uh, the impact of these projects on culture and the impact of culture on the success or failure of projects is less discussed. Um, I'd like to say that I regard culture as one component of the human rights of an individual or group. And as an example, we only have to look at the recent situation of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, China, to understand that denying a people the right to their language, their belief systems, and a way of life is both unethical and a flagrant abuse of their human rights. So this is the point that I'd like to make throughout our looking at projects that involve large displacement or resettlement um, is that not considering a, a group's cultural rights is also an abuse of their human rights. 
um, even well-meaning projects um, can have significant negative effects. An example I'd like to use, which is not from Asia, it's from some, a case study that I read about, is a 1970s hydroelectric project in the Ivory Coast. And it illustrates how easily developers can overlook the significance of culture when planning a project intended to benefit the country. Um, this particular project required resettling 75,000 people. And many members of the impacted community, communities refused to leave their ancestral lands. And this reminds us of things that Nadja said, and also uh, uh, Ore and Panwin. Um, when the planners, what the planners either ignored or didn't understand or thought was unimportant was that these, that these communities are composed of both the living and the dead, and that each of the living and the dead has a specific role to play within the community. The dead are not dead. They are found in the rivers, the forests, the woods and the fields. Thus for the communities to ask them to abandon their land and their cemeteries and their sacred forest would mean abandoning their ancestors. So they didn't want to move. In this case, eventually, if this was the 1970s, the people were forced to leave, but it did have human costs and at least one older man committed suicide because he could not bear the move. Do we have examples from the Mekong? Well, of course we do. Um, since the 70s, you know, have developers learned more about respecting and understanding the rights of communities, including their cultural rights? We now have in all the big, uh, the, the banks, the ADB, the World Bank, they all now have environmental impact assessments. They have social impact assessments. They have something called free prior and informed consent. We have lots of participatory exercises, but in the end, has the situation improved? And I would argue that the situation is still very mixed. Um, and it has to do with whether or not governments truly want to respect the rights of communities or put the priorities of economic development over that of the, of the communities. Um, in 2016, in January, 2016, I was on mission to Ratanakiri and you'll see in the lower uh, right hand um, uh, slide is a picture of one of, of the Kachok community in Ratanakiri that I visited. Um, I was there as part of a, a small group doing a preliminary assessment mission for a project. And in the process of conducting focus groups with two villages, one from the Kachok, the group that is on the right, and one from the Jarai, we learned that uh, there were tremendous conflicts um, that the villagers had with a Vietnamese company who, with a loan from the IFC, which is part of the World Bank, uh, the company had obtained a large concession of land consisting of thousands of hectares of, their, of the community's sacred forests in order to plant rubber. In 2014, the villagers had filed an official complaint with the IFC and the World Bank. The IFC officers were apparently dismayed to learn about the conflict with, with the communities because this violated World Bank, uh, the World Bank policy of due diligence regarding the safeguards for indigenous peoples. Trying to salvage the situation, the Vietnamese company said, oh, it'll be all right because what we'll do is we'll have a, um, we'll have a special ritual and we'll sacrifice a water buffalo and that will make it, will make the communities feel very uh, comfortable about the, uh, uh, the, the, the confiscation of their, of their lands. However, they were wrong. While we were there two years later, um, the one of the Kachok villagers, an older man from the village complained to us that, we are like the dog under the foot of the elephant, uh, meaning that there was nothing that they as the villagers could do. Um, they were too small, they were too weak, and they were afraid of both the company and the local authorities. However, um, after we left, we didn't really follow the situation, but we learned just recently that in 2019, uh, in fact, there had been an ongoing um, uh, dispute, uh, a dispute consultation with an ombudsman from the World Bank. And in the end, the Cambodian government was asked to return the sacred lands to the communities. Another case that I'd like to bring to your attention is a dam project uh, along the U River in Laos. And we see this in the picture on the left with the temple that is submerged uh, beneath what is the reservoir. 
Um, oh dear, my time is up. Can I do one case, one example here, Miriam? Um, the dam was uh, the dam was inaugurated in November 2019, and it flooded the section of the river that flows past three ethnic villages. Um, the reservoir flooded the old villages, and the communities, of course, were relocated. And I just want to quote two uh, two people from two of the villages that commented on the on on the sorrow they felt when they were removed from their temple. The village temple in one village was totally submerged, and that's the one in the photograph. Um, and although the Buddha image from the old temple was relocated to a new one, one elder sadly said, the Buddha image that was housed here was the spirit of our community. Now it has been moved to a new place. This will affect our destiny so that no matter how we try, our fate will never improve. We will only fall just as our temple has flooded. We Lao people have abandoned our religion and the Buddha will abandon us in return. So I think by looking at these case studies, we can understand that culture is very significant to the people in the villages that are being relocated. And often the people, the governments, the officials who are doing the projects don't really ask about these questions. They focus on the fact that they will need new land, they will need new houses, but they don't really take the time to understand what the people uh, in the villages really feel about their relocation and how this is going to affect them in the future. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And um, yeah, this, I think locating these concerns in in people's experiences and worldviews is extremely important and builds on all the themes that the other panelists were drawing on. So we actually have a range of questions. Um, the first one, I'm actually, maybe what I'll do here, we'll have about 20 minutes for everybody to talk and, and um, panelists, one of our um, adjudicators, either Jamin or Carlin will be keeping time. So we'll make sure to, to keep our comments to about two minutes when we, when we take space. Um, so the first question is to Ore. Could you please say more about the game of development in Laos? So one of your um, interlocutors, one of your interviewees said something about the game. This is a game they know they're meant to lose, but they don't, or they know they're going to lose, but they don't know um, what other game to play. I think that's the reference from your film. So are yeah. there particular vulnerabilities or resistances to this game? Maybe you could define the game a little bit. And um, what are the agreements that China has made with Laos? In the video, it says there's probably agreements existing. And then maybe connect that a bit to Botan and um, why is Botan an important region? So go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the question. We'll cover in two minutes, but it's a great <laughs> <laughs> I guess the game that was mentioned in, um, in, in, in the interview, right, was talking about uh, relying on foreign uh, foreign investments and foreign companies to you know to develop uh, to develop the country and um, yeah uh, sorry what was the what was the what was the subsequent question relating to that um, what are the particular vulnerabilities right um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm uh, the person to to answer that yeah because I don't know enough you know in depth about this to to answer that maybe um, some of the other panelists can can uh, yeah, chip in with their with their opinions and uh, the other question is um, yeah the deals that's being you know probably negotiated the problem with Laos is that uh, a lot of this information is not forthcoming you know even when I was uh, researching on my uh, high-speed railway project um, trying to find out more information I mean it, it was a black hole like there's no I, I could only find a few articles about it but that's it you know they just give the basic informations and yeah there's no information there's no more uh, further information that's why I had to uh, interview so many different experts um, and also I mean there's a lot of speculations right on what are some of the deals that's being negotiated but nobody can confirm you know nobody can um, say that they know for sure what, what, what was happening 
Yeah, so that's the situation for Laos. Mm -hmm. And uh, as to why Boten is such an important uh, town, it's it's actually on the north of Laos um, after the Long Prabang, uh, sorry, after the Long Nam Ta province. So it's right at the border. Um, there's interest from China because um, when, when it was first leased to, to, uh, to, to a Chinese development company, so they built the first, so, so actually two, two developers, um, you know, uh, was, uh, took over the lease. Um, so the first one built a casino town around it. Um, and then, but there was a lot of problems with it. So the town was closed down, the casino was closed down, and then the town was abandoned. So I guess they realized from their mistake that, you know, that's not going to work. And then hence, when the second developer took over, and that's when they decided to turn it into a touristic uh, destination. Yeah, mm. I hope that answered the questions. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's always, these panels raise more questions than we are ever able to answer, but they hopefully will will connect people who share your similar passions and interests and and, so thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to direct another question. This one is for Panwin about remittances. Um, so I guess there are two questions. One is, are there statistics or what do we understand about informal remittances? And the other one is, um, and you can answer both of these or one of these, um, how do remittances impact land use and maybe labor, land labor in, in, in sending areas. I'm okay. actually, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It might be in receiving areas or maybe I misunderstand. Go ahead. So in terms of the first question on the informal remittances, this type of, um, because income in general, when we collect data, income remittance earnings are actually pretty hard to capture accurately. So with the informal remittances, I don't think there's data on that unless you um, collect the data as part of a project, collect the data yourself basically. But, but for, I saw questions pertaining to remittances, but for Laos, the remittances is, is, is pretty low. Um, it's about 2% personal remittances of GDP, but these numbers can be um, underreported because it's again, involving remittance income. And um, in terms of land use and remittances, I think that's a very interesting uh, research question and how remittances affects um, uh, labor supply that 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 is actually not sufficiently addressed in the economic uh, literature. But um, I actually don't have an answer to how remittances affect land use. Uh, we examine in the Nepal paper how uh, migration affects uh, land use but not remittances we didn't collect any remittance uh, earning data because it's quite a sensitive variable um, but in terms of remittance on labor supply i also don't have an answer to that because my research didn't include a remittance variable it's hard to capture in any data set but to answer this question in terms of migration in my paper i found that migration actually increases the labor supply of those who are left behind, especially uh, the working age population in terms of agriculture. And so, so migration definitely increases the workload because of the withdrawal of uh, family members uh, elsewhere. And I see my time is up, so I will end here. Yeah, that's great. And I think your work also just to, just to elevate and, and um, celebrate your work for the for the audience. You know, it also I know you're also interested in the way that migration um, affects different kinds of household labor, which which of course in rural communities directly is related to land use. So, for instance, if all the if all the working age people leave, then children and elderly people. Um, not only does the workload go up, but then you have children and elderly people who are also working more. Um, Etc. So anyway, your work is, I think, really interesting and addresses these questions in all kinds of ways. So um, I know there are folks in the audience who are really interested in remittances and they should definitely get in touch with you so they can continue that conversation. Um, let's see here. So actually this one might be good for both Na and Heather. 
and there's interest in um, now nah, you mentioned in, um, that one of the ways that people resist is to simply not move. Um, and then we're interested in uh, other ways that, so in addition to refusing to move, how else are people resisting the, the first phase, not, so not dam breaking displacement, but the displacements and ruptures that are occurring when development imperatives apply. Um, what kinds of resistances do different communities practice? And then what are the state's responses? Are there, are there violent responses? How, what, what are the responses? So Heather and, and Nga, um, both of you, and then I know Jamin is keeping time in the chat, so make sure we keep an eye on that. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Oh, wow. I mean, obviously, refuse to move is the, you know, very, very common way to, to resist, right? But villagers, they may, some of them would just delay the time and some would just totally refuse until, you know, they was forced to move. Uh, but in terms of like the government response, it's not, not like violence, violent, like you see like people who, um, but it's more like they would have, um, no truck to come and have everyone <laughs> in the truck and then move to a new place. Um, but then, you, you know, uh, the other also, like the, the different way that I know, that uh, before they had to move, they planted, um, you know, uh, fruit trees, perennial trees, they, re they, they renovate the house and to get more like, you know, different type of like um, compensation and say, okay, here we already invest in it and, and you know, we don't want to move. Um, so it's, it's that often like happened before um, they actually had to move. And a lot of time they just, then when they signed agreement that they would move, but the day they had to move, they did not move. So that's that kind of thing. Um, mm, so I guess uh, maybe Heather's, um, you can add more, because I guess oh, we're okay, limited well, in terms of time. I think, I, I think it really depends on what the project is. Obviously, if they're building a dam or a road and it's going through, the, you know, if the dam is being built and the reservoir is, being, is going to flood their villages, they eventually have to move. But I know of other cases where um, people that lived in the uplands and were being moved into the lowlands more for a project of trying to give them more access to hospitals and schools and better uh, services. Um, the government might move the people down the mountain and they would do it. And then suddenly about maybe two months later, because it wasn't, you know, the, the, the upland area wasn't forbidden to them, uh, the government officials would find that a lot of the older people had moved back up to their former villages. I saw this in Laos and also the Sichuan Bana in China, um, where the people again missed their homelands. Um, another example would be in China, um, a lot of the Tibetan herders are being moved off the grasslands for an environmental project to green the, to green the grasslands, and herding was considered very damaging. And uh, they were moved into settlements that were closer to towns. And again, the older people were miserable. They, as you say, they, they, have, they lost their livelihoods. They were herders. They no longer had their yaks. Um, and they were unskilled and were not able to find other ways to earn a living. And uh, one study found that these, the older people would often go back to other areas of the grassland that hadn't been disbanded and they would still herd for different times during the year and then go back to the towns. So these were, I think, examples of when you didn't have an absolutely, where it was absolute they had to move because their villages would be destroyed, but where they still had the options to maybe go back and forth. I'm talking into a muted microphone, sorry. <laughs> um, does, honestly, I have. I wish I could just take up all the space and respond to all of you because you're raising so many interesting questions. Do any of you have comments for each other or want to build on one another's points before, or ask each other questions before I continue? 
Um, I don't know if we have time for this, but I have a question for now. So uh, I, I, I spoke to an energy you know, expert and then he's, he's, he mentioned that actually hydro dam is one of the cleanest and most efficient way to, uh, of energy production. So I'm wondering whether is there a better way to balance the, the, the benefits and effects of, uh, of that? And if there is a way, a better way to mitigate the impact of, uh, display, of dam induced displacement. Thanks, Ori. Well, yes. Well, you know that hydropower is considered like renewable, right? Because it's like a river flow. Um, and, and but, I mean, large dam always accompanied by massive right, number of people who have to displace. And I think that it's probably be much better if we. Um, you know, a country like you know, balance different source of energies, right? And also in terms of for, for hydropower, um, it's very important to have all like the detail um, studies before, you know, you go ahead with the, with the dam. And also for, for the people, for example, at least people need to know where they move to. At least they need to know what kind of livelihood they, they would have to, you know, uh, in the new place and the training, what kind of training are in place, right? Because many people, uh, they would displace to a new place, to a new site and they never visited it before, right? It's just say like they moved there, moved there. They didn't know like what, what type of land that they would have. So that make it very, very difficult. And I think that's, uh, that's why most of the time um, people got, um, you know, it took very long for them to recover their, their, their livelihood. And, you know, not just livelihood, it's just life, right? The connection with the land created the, the new um, type of living environment that they feel comfortable with. Because, you know, in, in general, they, they, have, they know nothing. They never consented whether they should move there or whether, you know, the dams should be built. Um, so I think that's, that's the, the problem. It's probably, you know, it, it's better. If, way better if we, we can we can have all the, the studies and, and preparations for people beforehand. I think um, the points that everybody's raising here that draws a lot on the panel that we just had last month is that um, you know, that panel was about commodities and, and um, the way that the Mekong River Basin is situated in global commodity chains and and they couldn't have the discussion without thinking about commodities as a part of a broader ecosystem and the ways that the people producing them, that their lives are bound to, you know, and I shouldn't say they, all of our lives are bound to our ecosystems. And so um, what this panel is illustrating, right, and we think about displacement is um, not simply the movement, moving across borders or within borders and how we move, are we moving surreptitiously and safely, are we moving or are we coerced, but really thinking about how this is, a, is functionally um, a signal of broader ruptures in, in kind of global capitalism and the, and the, um, the game that Ori's uh, interviewer, interviewee referenced in the ways that that communities who find themselves, you know, attempting to sustain themselves in, in the face of various kinds of market and development encroachment are, are attempting to sustain this with both cultural and ecological and, and livelihood knowledge. And, and those ruptures are, are quite violent in a number of ways. And all of your work is, is so powerful in illustrating this. We have exactly, I think, three minutes before we have to wrap up. And I think there is a, um, an important question that we might just ask folks to, to speculate on. We are speaking as disembodied heads from all around the world. And of course, many, those of us in, in the US experiencing a good bout of, of shot and fraud that we cannot travel while we talk about um, communities of whom we are not a member. Um, so much of what we know about this may simply be through the news and our partnerships and collaborations, but I, I'm wondering if anyone can talk about how COVID is, is affecting migrants um, and communities on the move in the region. Um, and then there's a question specifically about COVID migration and, and women and children. So we'll take about any, if anybody, this is sort of open for folks in, in your knowledge about what's happening in your field sites in your communities, and then we'll wrap up. I, I can contribute something to this discussion. 
briefly. Um, so in the case of, of Thailand, uh, the country has been closed um, during the past 12 months. And because the country is heavily um, dependent on tourism, it's badly affected. And in my community in Bangkok, 7-Eleven has closed. And so when 7-Eleven has closed down in Bangkok, there's, there's a major issue. And other 7-Eleven in Pattaya or in, in Phuket has closed as well. So this is a strong indicator of economic downturn. And because of this, um, migrants' job are uh, severely at risk, and also, but but the extent to which they're at risk depends on the sector that they work in. So, if they work in tourism uh, sector or uh, recreational or um, hospitality, uh, retail, especially in the seafood industry where the local uh, local spread has recently happened, they're severely impacted. And if they are also working in informal occupations, they're also more severely affected because they lack contracts and they don't have any bargaining power. So, so the, the job prospects of migrants is, has been severely affected, especially those people who are earning minimum wage and they have to get the COVID test because now they have to show a negative COVID test to their employers because of the recent uh, outbreak that happened in December of last year. But a lot of people don't have money to do that because they earn only 330 baht. And in order to get a COVID test from private hospital, they have to pay 4,000 baht. And that's, um, they have to work at least 12 days for that. So it's a major, major problem. Thanks, Panwin. Um, would anyone else like to add context from your field sites or what's happening where you do your work? So in terms of closing, I'd actually like to invite the panelists to think with us for a moment about what are some of the issues that we, you would encourage the audience to think about moving forward if, if we can remember you know, one or two things from this discussion. What would you like us to think about moving forward when we think about migration, movement, displacement in the region? Um, it's a big question with the sort of limited answer. Um, so take a moment, but what have you, you know, you can phrase it as, as a tentative answer, but I would welcome your thoughts so that audience members can exit with some good food for thought before we reconvene on April 7th for our third panel on the webinar series uh, with Dr. Courtney Work and on um, spirits and spiritual lives of the Mekong. Does anybody have a thought you wouldn't mind sharing? What should we walk away with? Um, let me let me say something about this. Um, I think I feel that uh, it's very important for us to put ourselves to try and put ourselves in in the shoes of uh, you know the, the people who are facing displacements from uh, development induced. Uh, projects. So very often uh, they were first informed that okay, there's going to be this development coming, and then they they might have to move. Uh, you know, it's it's not for sure, and they don't know when they have to move. So it could be a few years, it could be just next month, right? But they they um, they exist in this state of limbo where they they can't see what's coming ahead. You know, they don't know what's going to happen, and you know they they don't uh, they don't try to add any, uh, for example, any renovations, or they don't try to grow new crops on their land because they don't know when you know all of that will disappear and then I mean for the at least for the examples in Laos very often when they have to move it's at a very short notice right it's just like you know the next day or the next week and then they have to pack everything and then they have to change uh, you know uh, relocate and then all their everything that is familiar to them the, the bond with the communities and the, their way of life you know could just change like that um, yeah overnight so um, in order for us to better understand uh, what kind of uh, difficulties that they're facing. I think it's good for us to try and put ourselves in, yeah, in, in their shoes. Mm. Thank you, Ori. And your films help us do that in so many ways. So it's really wonderful um, that you're working in the way that you do with the audiences. We are all very lucky to get, um, to get familiar with your work through this panel. Um, I think we have about 30 seconds for everyone now, I'm not everyone combined, but if I wanna give everybody a chance if you just have one more thought you'd like to add before I wrap it up. Anything you'd like us to think about? 30 seconds to a minute each. 
Okay. Well, it is truly the um, great pleasure of my job. I can't believe this is my job, that I get to host conversations with such brilliant and talented and disciplinarily diverse experts. And, um, and I'm so grateful to all of you for preparing your thoughtful comments on these questions. And I'm so grateful to the audience for joining us. And, and I'm so sorry we couldn't actually ask all of your questions, but I encourage you, every person on the panel, you can find us through the internet. Um, so please connect with us if possible, ask us questions and, and be in touch with us if, if you're interested in this webinar series moving forward. Again, in about two weeks, we'll post it for, for folks if you wanna use it for classes or for future reference and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to translate uh, and make it even more accessible. It's such a wonderful thing that we can, we can have these seminars around the world at the same time. So with that, good morning and good night and thank you so, so much. We will see you next time.